Well, within the general frame of this uh, uh, meeting here, knowledge and social power, which was so excellently just explained by Jan Jacobs, I want to talk about scientific knowledge and social power. And I will say about more about it in general terms tomorrow when I have another talk. I have to concentrate on one specific issue, which is how international, how scientific cooperation, international scientific cooperation can contribute to build trust, not only among scientists, but even in, in politics. And I think trust is the basis of all human activities. Any uh, contract or agreement or whatever it is, is not worth the paper it's written upon if it's not based on a minimum of trust. So, uh, how can scientific uh, activities help to create trust? Well, I think in two ways. First of all, scientific uh, activities nowadays, in practically in all domains of science, is based on international collaboration. And then it can build trust in two ways. Either among the individual scientists themselves, that's one thing, where it helps to, to uh, well, I'll come back to that. Or the second level, which might not be so obvious to you, is that the international collaboration needs also to involve on different levels politics. I want to talk about how scientific uh, uh, interaction, international collaboration can help to create trust in two ways, first among the scientists themselves, but the second point, which may be more surprising, is it can also radiate into politics. And to demonstrate that, I just had the time to talk about two examples, two organizations where I have been still involved in. One is CERN, the laboratory for uh, uh, particle physics in Geneva, which uses in a tunnel, which you see in the, the 20 kilometer tunnel, where the largest scientific instrument which exists today is housed. And CERN was created after the Second World War in 1943, with two objectives, and I think it's uh, unique in that sense, not only to promote science, but also to promote the interaction between people and countries which had been fighting during the war. The second example, we'll come back to it, is Cesare, a light source now in Jordan, which has been created after the model of CERN. Now, CERN has now 22 member states. It's a informally European laboratory. You see the member states in blue on the <coughs> chart. Uh, it has now a source stage. It to become a world laboratory with associated countries in green, including the United States, Soviet Union, India, and so on, and has contracts with many other uh, countries in the world. You see a list of the countries now there. It goes from Af Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. CERN is making available facilities to outside users, and there are nowadays more than 13,000. That figure here, 12,000, is uh, old already, now seven years. There are more than 13,000 users, scientists, engineers from all over the world coming to work there. And this gives opportunity, what's nowadays called diplomacy through science. To explain a little bit, on this big machine, the experiment, what's called experiments, where detectors, instruments built to observe what's happening during the visits which are produced there. And there are several big uh, such so-called experiments. I think these are in reality big projects, each involving about 3,000 scientists and engineers. They have an independent budget, independent of CERN. These people, outside users, have to bring their own money and provide uh, material and kinds. And each of these projects, so-called experiments, cost several billion dollars. But they are organized in a completely democratic way. A project costing several thousand billion has no legally COE. And if I talk to industrialists, they say that cannot work. But it works. They are organized completely in a democratic way. They elect a spokesman, and all the decisions are made, taken by committees and so on. Uh, this is an interesting project, maybe for 
future global collaboration. It has been discussed, in fact, in the economic forum in Davos, and last year we had a meeting at the UN in Geneva in collaboration with, the, with us, where this was discussed whether this third model of global collaboration could be used for other projects. To give an example, one of these so-called experiments is CMS, it's called, I won't go into details. It, there are 3,500 scientists and engineers in this one project. You see part of the collaboration here in front of the detector they have built, involving students from 194 institutes in 43 countries. And of course, there people are working together on light shifts, discussing uh, the technical problems. They get to know each other, people from Europe, from Asia, and Africa, uh, South America. And I think there they learn tolerance, they learn how to behave in an honest way, and how to be, uh, behave in a rational way, and how to find compromises. To give me one example of collaboration, uh, when I was there, it was the first time in the previous experiment, where for the first time, scientists from the Public Republic of China and Taiwan were allowed to work for the first time in a common experiment. To get that through, I needed the explicit agreement of Deng Xiaoping at that time. Well, how can this kind of uh, collaborations, which certainly uh, have important uh, consequences among the scientists, radiate into, uh, into, uh, into diplomacy and politics? Give you only can give you only two examples. Uh, in, the, in the time of the hottest Cold War, in the 1960s, CERN was the only organization which was prepared to sign an agreement with the Soviet Union. This agreement later became the model. Means some trust was built up with that agreement. This agreement served later as a model for a similar agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. And I learned later that that again was the basis for a later agreement between an agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States signed by President and Ford. Give you another example. It's now 30 years. There was a disarmament uh, meeting in Geneva uh, between the, uh, uh, the President uh, uh, Reagan and, uh, and, uh, and Gorbachev at that time. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. this armament involved nuclear physics, and the presidential meetings are prepared by uh, Sherpas. There was uh, one day the leader of the American uh, delegation called me and said, look, we are in a deadlock, we need a, a place where we can discuss freely without microphones our problems. So I invited them to dinner at CERN, and I was informed later that there there is a possibility to really discuss and solve the questions. Finally, I mentioned the Sesame, this uh, uh, laboratory in, uh, in uh, Jordan now, where uh, I copied the constitution of CERN, so every scientist of the world has the right to go there and work there. The member states you see here, the idea, uh, orig original idea, of course, was to bring together Israel and Palestine, but now you see also this Iran there, in the council of that organization, the representatives of the government, not scientists. So there, the government representatives of Israel and Iran sitting peacefully together and discussing problems. Also, delegates of Cyprus and Turkey. Uh, the Sesame uh, was started like third under the umbrella of UNESCO. So when the, the groundbreaking ceremony was uh, in the was there King uh, Abdul II, who is very much in favor of this project, and Director uh, General of UNESCO, Matsura. And uh, well, here you see a users meeting, there you see in the middle, the head is a Palestinian, on his right side, an, an Iranian, and so on. So, uh, in a time, I think, where there's relations between some nations are characterized by hatred and violence, I think it's very gratifying to see that cooperation, scientific cooperation, can bring together politicians, politicians and scientists to work peacefully together. I think there we have a concrete way, not only theoretical discussions, how transforming scientific knowledge power into social values. Thank you.